Can anybody hear me? Oh, cool. I can hear me. Awesome. So, just before we begin, I'm quite a connoisseur of the animated GIF, and just in an attempt to be inclusive, if you see... Ooh, do I have a laser? Yeah, if you see that on the slide, it means the next slide contains a GIF. So if you have suffer from a vestibular disorder or something that would make you uncomfortable, uh, just look away, listen to my voice. It's lovely and interesting and ethnic. Um, <laughs> so I hope that makes you feel better and doesn't spoil your enjoyment. And because this slide is, contains it, the next slide is animated. And this is where I feel after four days. Um, so I like to relax before doing it a conference talk, so I like to make you move. After four days of sitting down, um, yeah, probably going to help. So, hello, I'm Lewis Kuiper, both in life and pretty much everywhere on the internet, and I just want to chill out for a bit. So, you've heard a lot of fantastic talks, and I hope you've had the chance to meet some great people and chat to the sponsors and the speakers after their talks, but I would really love it if you could stand up for me. Feel free, have a little dance, a little shake, up, shake off, you know. Now, could everybody take a deep breath and just hold it, just nice and slow. Now, on three, I want you to blow there. Okay? All good? One, two, three, go. <laughs> Wasn't that nice? Just relax, it's okay, don't worry. So, yeah, forklifts and all that. Feel free to sit down. I'm going to have a glass of water and just enjoy that moment. So, forklift driver to developer in nine months. And I'm at Lewis Kuiper. As you can see, I pink sparkly heart, JSCon for you. Um, so feel free to tweet at me with any questions or comments after. So picture the scene. You wake up, it's still dark. You fall into some clothes for the day and you open the door to leave. And would you look at that, it snowed. Now, your job doesn't allow you to do remote working. Your job doesn't require a Wi-Fi connection, and you're not sitting in front of a computer. So you can't turn around, you just have to make the best of it. So you get there, dress in the overalls, put a fleece on and gulp down some tea because we're in Britain and that's how we warm. This is your work. Recovered steel pipe, most probably from an oil rig or field. Uh, the ones on the left there are five and a half inch. Uh, the, one, the bigger ones over here are nine and five eighths, and the small ones are three and a half inch drill pipe. And remember, that's right, regardless of the fact you're in Britain, we deal with Americans, all the sizes make me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> um, and your biggest asset is probably going to be one of these, because that bundle right there is going to weigh around three to four tons, and I've discovered if you try and pick them up, it doesn't work. <laughs> so, oh, and if you drop that, I've discovered as well, Steel pipe beats ground. So add that into the rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock thing. Steel wins. And, yeah, and you can break things <laughs> really easily. So your job is to move these to your working area, uh, where you're going to cut the pipe with something like this. Well, this is, I tried, desperately tried to find a picture of my actual machine, um, but my actual machine was in a small hut. Uh, was not nearly that clean and, yeah, just generally a bit grummy. Uh, so we basically built a corrugated iron shed around that with two whole, massive holes in the side for the roller beds. So your job becomes really manual and really repetitive very quickly. It's varied because sometimes something breaks and then you have to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, you know, some correlation. But it gives your brain a lot of free time when you can just switch off mentally at your job. And I spent a lot of time analyzing my work. So if one cut takes X amount of time, how long would 1,834 cuts? Because that's also right. Nobody buys an even amount because they're buying by distance, and it's 1.588 meters. So including setup and teardown, if I can get seven cuts out of a 12-meter pipe, but eight out of a 13.5-meter pipe with slightly less waste, it's better to dig out the longer pipe. And soon enough, my notepads in the inner wall of the saw shed looked a bit like this. And my colleagues, who were less mathematically inclined than me, thought I was Russell Crowe in A Beautiful Mind or something. But I really like computers. That's, I've, I've played with them for a very large number of years. 
Um, and I like to think it was my analytical mind that led me to programming, or at least kept it fresh. And I'd done some the basics of basic at school, and I tried out going to university for computer science, but I was from a very small town, and I got kind of overwhelmed by being in a city that didn't close at nine o'clock. Um, so I spent some, a lot of time doing what we were doing for the last few days, and partying and staying out way too late, not getting enough sleep and needing to do work in the morning. And I signed up for an OU degree, uh, computer science and design, and as soon as I got into second year and was introduced to Java, I didn't find it particularly engaging. I felt like I was learning in a bubble, and without the atmosphere of a classroom, I just didn't seem to be able to really focus and understand why on earth I had to type public stack void main every time, and I still don't. I just wanted to make things happen with my computer, not learn a load of keywords to get around. And my luck started to change when I learned that in the next city over, about 10 miles away, there were programming meetups. People got together in their spare time, unpaid, and talked about programming and taught people stuff and answered questions. So it combined a group of people with enthusiasm for teaching and people who wanted to learn. And the Venn diagram of those people is basically the same. Everybody wanted to teach and everybody wanted to learn. It was fantastic. But there was going to be a crowd. And you know, you have to say the right thing at these meetups, right? You've got to kind of know the lingo. So I said public static main void before I ordered a drink, and everybody laughed. It <laughs> kind of worked. But I persevered and eventually kind of learned some of the lingo and people who were there that were happy to answer any stupid questions I had about the topics being discussed or really just anything related to dev environment as a whole. And when you feel like you've got to say the right thing to fit in at, at any time, somebody's going to find out that you're not, you don't know all the things. You just kind of start sticking to saying the one thing that gets you through these meetups. And yeah, I liked games. I liked playing games. I liked, uh, I liked the idea of making games. And one of the groups uh, was putting on a game jam in a month or so. And I thought, oh, wow, I can do some actual programming here. And I'd looked at code on slides before at meetups, and it seemed really easy. So I mean, I was wrong. Definitely not easy. What they don't show in the code of the slides are the other 100 that make those ones work. But yeah, I, picked a, I, I essentially went to Google, game tutorials to learn programming, and discovered Python. Uh, and one caught my eye that was quite nice. It was a roguelike library. Uh, and the weekend before the game jam, this three to five hour tutorial took me 17. But I had a mostly functioning game, and that was really cool. That was like the first time I uh, made something from scratch. And when I went to the game jam, somebody asked if anybody wanted to do Python. And I was like, yes, oh my god, this is fantastic. I don't need to make a roguelike again on my own. And I didn't know JavaScript or Unity or Twine or the other tech that was on offer, so I just latched on to the people that were doing Python and didn't let go. And then there was a team, a team of people who knew that I had literally never done anything until the weekend before and were able to skeleton out the game and let me play with random variables and see uh, you know, how to implement proper, look, proper looking gravity and stuff like that. And like I even, I was quite proud, I implemented a parallax scrolling library for a platformer uh, when both my teammates said, no, we don't have time for that. 20 minutes later, it was done. I was the king of the world. And it was there that I met someone who I knew that did Java is work. And because I just started my course, I thought, oh, hey, well, I'm learning Java. I should ask them about like, what, what it's like to be a junior developer. Because like, he'd come in at the same, same kind of place and gone through their process. And it was a term that I'd seen a lot, but on job adverts, when you're looking for a junior developer, three years experience programming in eight different languages is like, what? <laughs> like, seriously? Catch 22, right? Junior developer, three years experience. Either they're not junior or you're not training the people in three years the right thing, and you should just not be doing that. So the company that you worked for hired developers via QA. You would spend a couple of years uh, within the QA department, moving from manual testing to browser automated testing of web apps, then move into in-dev team testing. And then essentially, by the time you get familiar enough with the integration tests, you just start writing unit tests, and then you're writing code uh, to go with them. And it seemed like a better job than fart lift driving. It wasn't weather permitting. It was indoors. There was an air conditioned office. We got free water. Like, what could go wrong? 
So I sent a CV away, heard nothing. Got in touch with my friend, he said that they couldn't find my CV, so I thought, okay, I'll try again. Tried again, still couldn't do it. I took note that an error existed, but as, at the same time as there has been an error process in your application, the next line was, congratulations, CV submitted successfully. So I thought, hmm, that might be weird. My friend got in touch after a few weeks and said they still didn't have any record of it. So I sent him an email directly with screenshots and steps to re reproduce the bug that I'd clearly found. And as it turns out, that makes you a pretty good hire for QA. <laughs> and I did QA for a bit and pressed buttons on web apps and soon got really, really bored of pressing buttons to make sure that the user flow works on eight different builds a day. Um, and, but I lived in the town where all the meetups were, so I was able to leave work and go to these meetups without rushing. I went to Python, functional programming, a bit of Ruby, uh, video games, but I really, really liked one of them, the JavaScript group. I loved how the language looked. <laughs> oh, great. Here's an excuse. I loved how the language looked, and I saw Ashley's talk talking about describing in, uh, iteration through an array. If you look at Ruby, when you already know what iteration is, it looks really nice. When you look at JavaScript, it actually explains what it's doing. It's great. Um, there's still like semicolons, and I would reference a function, and it wouldn't call, and I wouldn't know why, and it was because there was no brackets on the end. So yeah. But at the time that I got into JavaScript around uh, phew, February last year, um, having been programming for two or three months uh, at various meetups, so every month or so I'd do a, a new, new thing. So this was well into Node being a thing. IE 11 had been out for a few months, so I have, I'm like a clean slate for somebody presenting JavaScript as if for the first time. And they've played JavaScript image in the past, and you tell somebody, What's, what, what do you like to program in? And you say JavaScript, and they go, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Come on, you're programming. And you can open the dev tools and do this. And it, JavaScript was power. It was power over something that I just loved, which was the web. You could take any website and ruin it in the dev tools, break everything, because you completely didn't understand what was happening. But you knew four functions. And if you applied them in the right way, you could break everything. It was fantastic. And it felt like you could just type vaguely what you wanted to happen, and it worked. I mean, it was doing simple stuff, but it was amazing how quickly you can go from, hey, there's this thing called JavaScript, to enough power enough knowledge to be dangerous. I really liked uh, the Jen Schiffer quote from the intro on Friday, which was JavaScript is pseudocode with semicolons on the end. I, yeah, I get that. So it was just under nine months, or it was actually about eight months, um, that after I started doing manual testing that we had a reshuffle. I'd gone to Scotland JS and seen some fantastic talks and started giving talks at user groups about like, things that I didn't know anything about, which was great. But an opening in the UX team, uh, who were working on their first Angular JS application, having been doing Java rendered pages for uh, the entire company's life, and yeah, I think I said JavaScript often enough in the interview that they were like, "Yeah, we'll, we'll take you on," and I got the job. So suddenly, there's a team of hackers, and we're all doing JavaScript, and it's all so fun. But I get the title of the talk; it may have misled you. I didn't want to come here just to tell you my story, because really. Now I'm a developer, there's where the story ends. But I wanted to tell you about some things that helped me along, some that I learned myself, some that others taught, and definitely some that I wish somebody would have said sooner. So this talk is for you. If you know anybody who's starting on the path to becoming a developer, whether that's you yourself, a new colleague, uh, somebody who's kind of interested and they don't, you don't quite know how to deal with that. Um, or even, yeah, if you're watching this and think, that's me, I want to move into development. I came here to learn and be interested. And firstly, I would just say that this is not the right way to teach people modern web development. I realize that you can't see. Oh, no, it's actually contrasted quite well. Um, you can probably not read it, and that's entirely deliberate. So this is the uh, stack from uh, ThoughtWorks training course, the JavaScript Toolkit, which is great for experienced developers who want to know what tools they have available across everything. But when you're new, you feel like all the things I have to learn all of that before I can write a website? This is useless. And I think it's important that we should make learning materials at whatever level as accessible as you possibly can so that we can take people from this to this and be excited about learning the things that they need to learn. 
So let's go through some of the things that you could and should know about what I value as a new developer. First one, honesty. It's always nice. Because when you start out and you break something, you hit an error, you feel like you're the only one that's having this problem and you're having it because you're stupid and you, and you don't know anything. Because you can't figure out the right keyword to search for, you can't ask somebody because that would be terrible and then they'll fire you because, oh my god, it's, you've caused an error and it's broken something on your computer. And that's terrible. They feel like failures and what they don't realize is everybody programming all the time breaks everything, we just get better at fixing it, right? So when you've got a junior developer that's having a tough time with some new syntax or you're trying to go into ES6 or something, um, support them, but try and let them come across the answer themselves. If you write the code for them, you're just writing abracadabra, at co, JavaScript, lol, now we have an app, semicolon, and then it just works and you don't really learn anything because knowing that everyone was just as lost as me with things that they hadn't come across, helped a lot because it meant, felt, meant that I felt less like I was coding in a bubble and that I was actually improving because the things that I did know started becoming relevant. So with open source, this, picture, this next GIF perfectly encapsulates what I felt when I thought, oh, I'll just, I'll just look at that repository. That looks like an interesting project. And it turns out that there's a lot of open source software out there not all of them are great learning experiences, but there's a lot to learn from. And the community surrounding some of them are amazing, and I want to take the moment to highlight Hoodie, because that was my introduction last February, my first commit in an open source project. Um, and if you do want know anybody who does want to get involved in the community, there are some other awesome initiatives out there to help newcomers. So the Rails Girls project, and very recently, they just have finished their summer of code, um, where they crowdfunded uh, a large, basically trying to pay uh, people who wanted to get into development and uh, take them under the wing of an open source project who was happy to mentor them and answer any questions. It's fantastic. And their statistics are incredible, and I urge anybody who wanted to help to look to them as a real shining example of how to run an initiative like it. But back to my thoughts on things and stuff. Source control. Thankfully, I'm not going to go, deep on, go too deep on what source control is. If you're not using it by now, you should be. Um, you know that, that's fine, we're here, all good. But as far as a new developer, they may have never used it. I remember my friend telling me during a team project at his uh, master's uh, at a university that will remain nameless, he asked his professor, oh, so what happens if two people edit the same file? How do we like, fix that? Is there a nice way of doing it? And he was told that the project manager should make sure that doesn't happen. which works, bit cheap though, because <laughs> you have the opportunity to take somebody through source control for the first time. We've been using it for decades, I guess, now, as long as I've been alive. And yeah, new people don't necessarily have the mental models of what happens when you do a git add and a git commit and a git push. Um, and they may need some help with what should seem like quite simple or chore git tasks. And I discover, I've discovered that when you're doing an open source project, uh, you branch and you do the GitHub thing and you do branch, commit, and then open a pull request. But because you can do a tremendous amount of it via the GitHub UI, you never really get exposed to the actual commands that are going on. So I've become quite taken with using a graphical client for when multiple people are working on it. And if, somebody, if you know somebody who is struggling with Git, Explaining the principles rather than saying these are the commands you need to run, it's probably well worth your time. So this is one of the things that people at all levels tell everyone, whether, whether it's a firmly uh, object-oriented programmer trying out some functional programming or a systems dev trying front end, it always helps to see alternate ways of doing things. There's you know, innumerable talks just suggesting you write a lisp, for example, to really get under the skin of how functional programming works. And as it turns out, for sure, the limit on what you can learn by trying new things out doesn't exist. But I think it's important to remember when you're new, don't dive too deep. You wind up with a load of breadth of knowledge in every which way of doing a single thing, but because you've never taken the step forward and tried to do more, you wind up kind of having a, a colored view on what some languages can and can't do. And keep in mind these next two points. So they say, even in my 
very young career, I've heard a lot, premature optimization is the root of all evil. And I suggest that that goes triply so for your software development education. Don't worry about how quickly you're learning and slow down and relax about it. And I know, especially coming to conferences, trying to keep up with all the new technologies, web APIs, and everything out there means that you feel like you've got to go fast. But honestly, learn at your own pace. It's super easy to get burned out on learning and not really enjoy what you're doing because you're continuously thinking about all these things that you don't know. And I say find your niche, because frankly, the stack doesn't matter. We are here at JSConf. We probably have JavaScript at some point in our stack, but that's not necessarily the best fit for everybody. So what you want to find out is at what level you want to, um, you want to work. And with you trying everything, you might stumble upon something that really clicks with you. And for me, it was the web, but for you, it could be systems programming. You might really, really love concurrent thread, port, server. I don't know the words. I know that they exist, and I just kind of shove them into a sentence, and sometimes people say, oh, yeah, I get what you mean. I, oh, oh, I've also heard that uh, in systems programming, everything has to be web scale. Is that a thing? I don't, I don't know. But yeah. Find your niche and explore more. The worst thing that will happen is that you learn more about something and learn that you don't really care for it that much, and that's fine. So there's this MVP, minimum viable product ID, that goes around every so often. Take the minimum shippable thing and ship it because, you know, shipping culture, was ha which has its own problems, but that's for another talk. And we should really get into the habit of teaching new developers that they should get it working first then focus on making it better. Because if they apply the same principles and it doesn't work, they have no idea why. And just for those of you in the back, that is a pile of sand being held down by a three-inch or four-inch wide strap, which looks like it might work. Probably won't. And I've lost count of how many times I've made a start trying to solve something and then second-guess myself because some bit, some inconsequential implementation de detail wasn't perfect, and then I was completely sidetracked from my, tra from my tra train of thought. Yeah. And if I could get over this, my GitHub profile would get a lot busier. But people are the number one thing that led me to being able to stand here today and talk to you all. Whether that's people in your local dev community, helpful people who answer questions on Twitter, people in open source communities, people in Slack, people in IRC, everyone and people were the number one thing that inspired me to join this web community. And we need to start considering interpersonal skills as a major part of leveling up as a junior dev. Because we need to remain accountable for our actions. Programming isn't the preserve of the super educated anymore, who have access to computers that fill entire rooms and can take a punch card and put out some binary. But we've moved past that. Anybody with a computer of any kind, anybody who picks up a Firefox OS phone for 30 bucks or whatever, can try out web programming. They can make an app in, I think, the current record upstairs was something along the lines of seconds. They have an app, it's there, they can use it, they can interact with it, they can learn from it immediately. And that's fantastic. But the problem with people is that there are haters out there. If you go onto Stack Overflow and say, hey, I'm having a bit of a trouble adding these two numbers again, what should I do? And the first answer is, use a jQuery plugin. <laughs> no, please don't do that. You need to be encouraging, giving them things to do that are would help them understand, because otherwise, certain websites look like this. You ask a question, and immediately everybody leaps down your throat because, oh my god, you're using Angular 1.2, you terrible human being. And I always like to think about it with GIFs, because I like animation. But you know who deserves to learn from you and who you can learn from? Literally everyone. Thanks, Gary. So. In short, one year and 26 days ago to date, I began my new life as a software developer. About seven weeks ago, I moved to Berlin and changed job. And I'm now a junior front-end dev. I'm very happy. And because I'm standing up here, hopefully I can be able to help at least one more person gain the confidence to get involved too. So thank you very much. I've been Lewis Kaufer. Oh, good. Actually, can I go? Is that timer right? So I've got five minutes there. I've got three minutes here. Just a quick thing, because I've got a few minutes. I want to just take a moment to talk about something that I've uh, been working really hard on. Um, oh, that's not mirroring. That'll work. Um, yeah, so, so let's look at hoodie and 
Hoodie CSS. So I've been working on a tool that takes a markdown file and pretty prints it with chalk. It's not really fully done, and code blocks don't look too good. But what I've aliased to in my uh, package JSON is npm run help. And I would thoroughly urge anybody using npm scripts as a build tool to please, please try that. Because when you run npm run as normal, you just get a list of the scripts. And that can be really helpful if you already know what all these dependencies do. But I just want to promote Ooh, my, uh, oh, that's what's wrong. I'm off the bottom. Sorry. Yeah, npm run help. Uh, and then pass it an input file, which I've called, ooh, ooh, what happened there? That was fantastic. Still working on it. Great, hold on. Oh, come on, stop. Oh, there we go. No, no, <laughs> don't ask me again. So basically, we have this markdown file that we can keep in sync. Um, it looks great on GitHub, and I'm hoping to make it look really good in your terminal. Take your, uh, the output of npm run and then just add comments. Tell people why you're doing what you're doing. It, it's hopefully going to take off, and everyone will really like it. And it'll help you go from, hey, what does this dependency do, to, great, npm start, awesome. I know exactly what's going on here. Um, so yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>